people who had been living in England for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And for them to look round and to see their president walking into the Royal Box at the Royal Albert Hall was a moment that maybe even five years ago they never thought would have been possible. And I think that was a fantastic moment in British-Irish relations. Do you think President Higgins should be invited to Stormont anytime soon? If if there is a, a reason for it, I have I have no difficulty. I mean, one of the, if, once we get to being a mature democracy, I would have no difficulty with President Higgins coming up Prince of Wales Avenue with the Union flag and the Irish tricolour for that occasion. What does, what does that mean, Mike? That what, be, once we become a mature democracy, I mean, that sounds like you're putting it on the long finger. How long is the finger? We're, we're certainly not where I think we need to be. And one of the so one at of the minute you wouldn't support his uh, his his invitation to Stormont. Well, wh why would he be coming to Stormont? I'm not saying no. But well, I suppose why would it's he a reciprocal visit. That's the point. That the, there may be an invitation. I don't know if you've heard anything about that speculation. Well, I, you'll know more than I do. Yeah, well, the, I mean, there, there, there obviously <laughs> are discussions taking place, and I would obviously very much support uh, President Higgins coming to. Uh, to Belfast and come to even, even though he beat you in that election. Well, well I, mean, I, 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 I I'm a huge fan of his. I okay, think let's go to Dublin. I think he's been the a tremendous president. Okay, let's park that conversation across straight over to Dublin and uh, see what is happening there. This is to do with this is Eamon Gilmore. We're looking at live pictures of Eamon Gilmore there, the leader leader of the Labour Party. Uh, let's hear what he has to say. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming here at your short notice. What we're going to do is the is going to make a... Okay, there is some speculation that uh, he may resign as Labour leader but remain as Tonishta until July. We were just talking about this a moment or two ago. Let's hear what he has to say. He's starting to speak to journalists now and there will be some flash photography, I think, over the next few moments. Ministers and Ministers of State, uh, the uh, Chairperson of the Parliamentary Party, Jack Wall, or... Chief Whip, uh, Emmett Stagg, and our General Secretary, uh, Peter McAuliffe. Um, at 10.30 a.m. this morning, uh, I informed the General Secretary of the Labour Party that I intend to stand down as leader of the party with effect from the election of my successor. I have asked that the Executive Board of the party immediately make arrangements for the election of a new leader of the Labour Party before the end of this spoiled term. I have had the honour and privilege to lead the Labour Party for seven years. In 2011, following our most successful ever general election, I asked the party to take on the responsibility of government during the worst economic crisis in the history of the state. I did so because I believed then, as I do now, that as citizens and as a party, we had a duty to put the country first to address the crisis, to get out of the bailout, to refer, reverse the loss of employment, to get the economy to recover, and to do so in as fair and just a manner as humanly possible. I still believe that that was the right decision, and I am proud of the progress we have made in achieving those objectives. But it was a course which carried a high political risk, and Labour has paid the price for that in the local and European elections. I deeply regret the loss of good public representatives and the defeat of outstanding Labour candidates last Friday. I have already spoken of the necessity for renewal. The party and the government must move on to a new phase and to look to the future. Where we have had successes, we must build on them. Where we have fallen short, we must do better. Where new problems are arising, we must find solutions for them. We must, and we will, continue to put the country and the needs of the Irish people first. And in doing so, we must hear, heed and act on the clear message we received on Friday. There is work to do, and I intend to be part of it. But I believe that the work of renewing the party is best done under new leadership. I want to thank all the members of the party, all of our public representatives and candidates, the party staff, and especially my own staff, who have worked so hard with me 
and for me over the past seven years. As I have said many times, I am immensely proud of the courage shown by those members of the Labour Party who over the past three years put their country first, who recognised that real politics is about finding real solutions and to put loyalty and country before everything else. It has been an honour to lead them and I look forward to working with them for a very long time to come. So there you have it, Eamon Gilmore resigning as leader of the Labour Party after seven years in charge. There will now be an election for his successor. He says that uh, the party has paid a high price for uh, its involvement in the bailout. He deeply regrets the loss of good public representatives. He says the party needs uh, a new phase, it needs to look to the future, that needs to be done under new leadership. And he says that his party has... Uh, heard and acted on the clear message we received last Friday. Mark, your thoughts on that? I mean, that's a bit of an earthquake, isn't it? Well, it is. It's the, it's the fate of a junior uh, coalition partner. It's been tough for them because uh, Sinn Féin and some of the other parties in the, on the left wing in the Doyle have undercut uh, their sort of traditional base of support. Instead, Labour has been seen as being uh, one of the parties having to administer, if you like, the austerity program which followed the bailout. So they have lost some of their natural constituency to uh, Sinn Féin and other um, parties. Uh, the, the question is whether the coalition government will continue now. Eamon Gilmore seemed to be saying there that you know, the government and the party must go on. So one would assume that if another Labour politician is then elected as leader, be it Joan Burton or whoever, mm. that they, they will take over in the role of Tornister. One uh, other aspect of this is that there was a lobby within the Irish Labour Party saying that whoever is the Irish Labour leader should hold an economic brief rather than be foreign minister because it was felt that they weren't seen to be tackling those economic issues of great concern to the electorate. So it'll be interesting to see if Labour continues to hold the foreign affairs brief, which of course uh, at the moment still controls uh, the, the policy of Dublin towards Northern Ireland. Um, Martin McGuinness, you're the Deputy First Minister in Belfast, he, as Taoiseach, is Deputy Prime Minister in Dublin. Um, but he was, uh, as, as, as Tonishta, he, he of course was an arch critic um, at times of Sinn Féin. Are you really sorry to see him go? Well, I, I think you're, you're sorry to see any political career end in this way. I mean, Eamon, uh, despite our political differences, uh, was a Tonishta, so he was involved in an awful lot of work with us at the different ministerial council levels. Uh, the different meetings that took place between us, the quadrilaterals that took place between Theresa Villiers, himself, Peter Robinson and myself. So from a personal point of view, I mean, we, we have to be civilised about this. It's, it's not nice to see uh, a career end in the way that uh, this career has ended. But I, I think that, you know, the reason this has happened is because there has been a massive kickback against the austerity in the South. The, the withdrawal of medical cures from disabled children the imposition of uh, water uh, charges, household charges. People have been taxed to the hilt where they haven't got any more money to spend. And I think there's been a kickback against austerity and that's why he has found himself in this predicament. But there's a much more important issue arising out of this now and that is, uh, obviously we can't preempt the outcome of a leadership election, but all of the uh, suggestions down south uh, is that if Amy Gilmore went, the, the probability is that Joan Burton will take over as leader of the party. I don't know if that will happen or, or even if she is favourite at this stage. But it raises the question then of whether or not this government will go the full term mm. to 2016. And I think the prospects of them not going uh, the full term are, are probably accelerated now by this decision. Well, you'd fancy your chances if there was a snap election, wouldn't you? Well, we fancy our chances in 2016 and we fancy our chances uh, tomorrow if there was an election. And I, I actually think given the way in which the political landscape has changed over the course of the last uh, number of days as a result of the elections in the South, both at European and local government level, that uh, the sooner an election happens, the better. OK, can I ask you just very quickly, as Tonishta and Minister for Foreign Affairs, did Eamon Gilmore engage in the politics of the North or Northern Ireland as much as he should have done? I, I don't think so. I, I don't think either the Taoiseach or himself engaged 
as much as they should have done. I think they uh, allowed themselves to be seen very much as the junior partner uh, to David Cameron rather than being seen as equals in relation to how the North was dealt with. Uh, and I think that was a huge mistake. And I think some of the political difficulties that we're experiencing uh, at the moment uh, is derived from the, uh, the, the, the effect of uh, second string that they played to the British government in London. Okay, Mike, Mike Nesbitt, your thoughts on uh, the departure of uh, what, someone you must have known a bit. Did you know him well? I was developing a relationship with him and I'm very, very sorry to see him go. As I say, I thought his speech last September set the tone for the presidential visit uh, to GB. Uh, in the discussions that I did have with him about <coughs> the issues, political issues here in Northern Ireland, I found him to be knowledgeable and to be understanding and sympathetic uh, to the unionist cause and to the fact that what we need to do is ensure that everything we do is fair. Not fair for unionists, but fair for everybody. And on occasions, uh, we're coming up a little bit short of the mark, but then all governments do. OK, let's um, hear from my colleague Shane Harrison, who's in Dublin, and uh, he joins us now. Shane, uh, certainly politics moving on apace this afternoon in uh, Dublin. Is there any huge surprise that Eamon Gilmore has uh, fallen on his sword? I have to say there is a bit of surprise, yes, because as recently as the weekend, he was saying that he had no intention of resigning. But since then, and particularly today, a number of Labour backbenchers, people of a younger generation than the Labour cabinet ministers at the moment, have been making it perfectly clear that they had very little confidence in him and indeed in some of their cabinet members. So this could well be a generational thing. The question is, will he remain on as Tornister? And it's my understanding that he will remain on as Tornister until there is the cabinet reshuffle and he is replaced as Labour leader because it will be the la new Labour leader who will have to decide with Enda Kenny, the Taoiseach and Fine Gael leader, who will be in the cabinet and what portfolios they have after these local and European elections. And that could well take some time because the Labour Party rules, as I understand it, mean that it, there are 45 days before nominations for a new leader ha close. But if it's the case that there is an agreed leader, then uh, things will obviously will change and we could move into a cabinet reshuffle an awful lot more quickly. Um, we were uh, hearing a lot of speculation there uh, from my guest that uh, Joan Burton is probably the likely successor. Does that make sense from where you are, Shane? Well, in the Labour Party, there have always historically over the last 10, 15 years or so been two factions. There's the faction in which Eamon Gilmore, Pat Rabbit, Princess de Rossa, what might be called the sticky faction, those people who had their roots in the official Republican movement, the Workers' Party, Democratic Left. And then there's what's been called as old Labour, the likes of Brendan Howland, the Minister for Public Expenditure, and Joan Burton. Now, Joan Burton is the deputy leader of the Labour Party. She has in the past, in a kind of slyly, sly way being critical of Eamon Gilmore but she's in her 60s as well and the young generation may well want to go for somebody who is a little bit younger they will certainly be looking for more cabinet replacements I would say that she would probably start off as the favorite but whether she remains as the favorite is another question um, and Shane just can you just talk us through how you think things are going to unfold uh, over the next few weeks and months so am, am I right in 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 um understanding that while he has resigned as Labour leader during that election campaign to find a successor, he would remain as Tonishta. Yeah, that, that's my understanding of what's going to happen. The Labour Party rules, as I said, allow for 45 days for nominations for a new leader before they're closed. Now, if it so happens and emerges that it's quite clear there is an agreed candidate, and at this stage that would appear to be unlikely, but if that is the case, then they may well have the cabinet reshuffle an awful lot quicker because the new Labour leader is going to have to get together with Enda Kenny and decide on the cabinet reshuffle and whether or not there's going to be a change, for example, in government policies. There has been talk about whether or not that this could well hasten a general election given the stability and the fact that Labour is going to be an awful lot more needy because €2 billion Euro at the current estimate are going to have to be taken out of the economy in terms of tax rises and public spending cuts in the next budget. The government says that will be the last of austerity. But the way I would see it would be that the Labour Party is most unlikely to want a general election any time soon, especially with what happened over the weekend 
and with Sinn Féin breathing that down the party's neck and the party will know from the lessons from the SDLP that uh, once Sinn Féin gets into particular territories it's very very difficult to remove the party from them and large swathes of Dublin particularly the the more poor the more deprived the working class areas they have gone en masse in these local and European elections over to Sinn Féin and it's very difficult to see Sinn Féin giving up that territory easily. Okay, Shane, thanks very much indeed for that. Our uh, correspondent Shane Harrison joining us there live from Dublin. Let's come back to my studio guests. Mike Nesbitt, the Ulster Unionist leader, uh, Sinn Féin's Martin McGuinness, Deputy First Minister, and our political editor, Mark Devonport. I feel very left out. You've been passing a phone around there and smiling. You um, want to that, let me in on the secret? Oh, the, 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 Don't the, the, tell him. Tell him nothing, <laughs> Pike. Um, it was actually Danny Morrison causing a bit of mischief. Ah, yeah. was it? He you was looking at Twitter, weren't he? He was noting that um, Joan Burton appeared to be interned in a little side room when Eamon Gilmore was making that announcement. Whether he was reading too much into that, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> we'll he was see. Definitely on a different wing of the party from uh, where he was. Okay, and 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 Shane saying there that um, perhaps unlikely that anybody would want to rush headlong into uh, a, a general election. I suppose that's not a huge surprise. Well, I mean, certainly, obviously, uh, the, the, the government will be concerned, the governing parties will be concerned, lest uh, any swift move would see them punished in a similar way to, to, to the way in which the Labour Party has at least been punished in these elections. So they may want to take a little bit of time about that. But you still have that possibility, though, that, that at some point the junior partner may say, well, look, we're going to be hung if we stay in, so we may as well get out. OK. Uh, someone passed me some figures a moment or two ago, which I duly passed on to you. And I've just passed them back to the person who passed them to us because I just Have wanted to... Reject uh, it. I, I, they were rejected. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a Spoiled different... vote, was it? Well, no, no um, it, it changed the actual order, and I just want, well, before I start changing the order of the candidates live on air on the basis of something somebody has passed to me, I wanted to double-check that because the latest tally it's that... very sensible, Mark. Yeah, the latest tally... That's why I passed it to you in the first place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the latest tally that... Uh, um, my colleague Martina Purdy was giving uh, just a, f a few minutes ago, which was si uh, had the similar order. Had Sinn Féin on 125,000 votes, the DUP on 95,000 votes, the Ulster Unionists on 60,000 votes, and the SDLP on 59,000 votes, and the TUV on 44,000 votes. Um, so that would actually show the SDLP closing up significantly, and it was uh, those figures that I just want double checking before we go with actually showed the SDLP leapfrog in the Ulster Unionists, which could uh, have all of the mathematicians out trying to work out the different permutations. But I, I wanted to be a little bit certain just in case. Is that because you're sitting so close to Mike Nesbitt? You well, it was, it was in, worth double checking. It was in case my failing eyesight was I was just reading the scribble on the page wrongly. Right, OK. You wouldn't like that set of figures, do, Mike. Do you want me to do you a set? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be very interested to see yeah. what you've put down on the paper. Nicholson, 750,000. Yeah, well, that would be impossible, given, yes, it uh, would. It, given that not as many people as that voted. But anyway, I'm sure you can only wish for figures like that. Um, 125, would, would, you'd probably be happy enough with that, Martin McGuinness, if that's what Martina Anderson did well, indeed, Paul. I don't know if that's a final count. No, so I, don't, I, think, I don't think it can be. I it's just the latest have, tally, we, yeah. We might have a, a bit to go, so uh, I don't think well, anything that I have seen changes my sense of how the three seats are going to fall down. I think that they'll, they'll go to the, ourselves, uh, the DUP and the Ulster Union. And, and just on that... Uh, since we have a moment or two. Was, was Alex Atwood, was the SDLP simply deluding itself and thinking that there was a seat there for the SDLP? Well, I think what they were doing sensibly from the, their own perspective was uh, playing up uh, the prospect that they could want a seat. But I think that given the fact that, you know, as the DUP had mentioned, that there was a, a shredded unionist vote, it didn't take account of the fact that uh, most of those people will vote down the order and that the... Jim, if he needed transfers, would be very comfortably home with uh, Jim Allister's vote, for example. OK, I think we're going to move people around in a second or two. Mike Nesbitt, just, just in case you get reshuffled during yes. this particular stage very of the programme. Very happy program. to be reshuffled. Fi fi final thought from you on, on where we are after uh, two hours and ten minutes I'm, of broadcasting. I'm tempted to say we're in the King's Hall, Mark. But, uh, but I you're think, not going to do that, Mike. I think we're in, a, we're, we're in a reasonably comfortable position, but I will not relax until we've had the declaration and, and Jim is over the line okay. and at that point as I've said kind of phase one uh, of my uh, leadership as in, into elections is over and it's successful and we move on with big big challenges and we have to build the mutual trust 
that was in the, the Belfast Agreement, and we haven't done that. And I think we agree on that. Yeah, well, I've, I've tried my best. It, <laughs> and I will be positive in my leadership. You just won't think it's positive. OK, well, let's, uh, let's, see. let's see where we are uh, next week and the week after. We're going to hear, Mike Nesbitt, thanks very much indeed. We're going to hear from uh, one of Mr Nesbitt's party colleagues, who is with Tara. Thanks, Mark. And yes, nobody's relaxing down here, but uh, we're waning a little bit. How is the Jim Nicholson camp? Yeah, we're still confident. Obviously, there's a lot of votes uh, still to be sorted, still a lot of votes still to be put in the boxes. And, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, to make an honest judgment uh, because they, they put some into the shells, they take them back out. But we're still confident in, that Jim Nicholson will be re-elected. Any criticism of the length of time it's taken? When we came here this morning, they sort of said, oh, first preference votes by two, half two. We're well past that. I think uh, we're pretty used to this in election campaigns and, and election counts because I've never come to account that they have actually kept on time from what the early predictions were. So I'm pretty used to it. I think this is taking a wee bit longer than, than most anticipated, uh, especially for the first count to come through. So yes, I think people are getting just uneasy and it's taken so long. And if they had a set at the start, it's going to take to four o'clock. Well, then people wouldn't have been uh, as uneasy from, from two o'clock on. I think we need to, uh, to look at the electronic counting mechanisms. We have had demonstrations on that at the Assembly. Each political party have been offered uh, demonstrations of it, and, and I know I have seen it happen myself. Uh, it is something we should uh, look at seriously. I don't know why they didn't put it in place for local council elections. I think the, the, there may have been an indication at one stage a couple of years ago that the next local government election they would try and have it in place, but I think it is something that we need to pursue. So the latest tallies that I've been told, looking at about 60,000 uh, votes so far for Jim Nicholson, what, what would you say to that? Is that what you're hearing? Yeah, I think uh, he will be well in excess of, of 60,000 at the end, uh, probably 70,000 uh, or in around that. But as I say, those are only uh, guesses, they're only, I suppose, uh, educated guesses on the basis of tallies, but in a tally like this, it's, it's really difficult to get all uh, a good, accurate assessment. I think, really, we need to just wait until the first result is announced. And what about Jim Allister then? What sort of a uh, dent has he put into the, the votes for all the unionist parties then, apart from his own? Yeah, Jim Allister appears to have, have polled fairly well uh, also, uh, much better probably than his party's local government campaign has, has reflected. So obviously there is a personal vote there for Jim Allister as well, and I think that will be reflected in, in, in the count at the end. But hopefully uh, Jim Nicholson, who has the, the experience and obviously the work rate in Europe, will be returned. What about uh, what happens next then? What do you see in terms of the Haas talks, in terms of some sort of progress? Because the turnout for this election has been higher than for the local councils, but people there's still around half the population who don't bother to vote. That's right. And, uh, obviously political talks will continue at, at, at whatever level, whether that's a continuance of the Haas talks, whether uh, Haas and Sullivan come back to Northern Ireland, I'm not sure. But obviously party leaders to some extent have uh, been talking in, in the interim. I think the difficulty is though so much has happened since then, especially around the letters of comfort that were given to the on the runs and I think that has been a major problem and, and certainly from the unionist perspective we feel that uh, talks will be limited until those issues are resolved. Okay, Tom Elliott, thanks for joining us. Back to you, Mark. Tara, thank you very much indeed. Now, Nigel Dodds has uh, joined us in the studio. Mike Nesbitt's gone off to stretch his legs. Martin McGuinness has kindly agreed to stay for a moment or two more. Mark Devonport isn't allowed away. Neither, neither am I. One interesting thing just before we uh, go, we were talking there about whether or not it would be appropriate for President Higgins to receive an invitation to Stormont and Mike Nesbitt said when we're a mature functioning democracy maybe but he doesn't think we're there yet. I just got a tweet from Professor John Brewer at Queen's University who says just to let you know President Higgins is coming to Belfast to an event at Queen's University in October. Well, which uh, I'm organising. So there you go. I mean, President Higgins does does visit here, but obviously, I think the the, the reason why the Stormont one will be of interest is because <laughs> of all the protocol, and you can remember those headlines in relation to the Haas talks about yeah. which flag should fly over the building and so on. Um, but th there certainly have been discussions, I think, um, about it possibly happening once we get these elections out of the way. Yep. Uh, Nigel Dodds, would, would you have any objection to uh, an invitation being extended to President Higgins at this stage? Uh, well, I, I don't know where this has come out of. But so. It's part of a previous discussion, just we were talking right. about how far um, things have come. Well, I think that those sorts of things in terms of state visits or official visits like that are organised, you know, at a higher level even than the Northern Ireland Executive, you know, the Foreign Office and all the rest of it would have to be involved in that. So we'll wait and see what comes of that. 
Okay, now, we, uh, we're very pleased to have uh, a Dodds on the set, but um, uh, no disrespect, but the focus very much today on your, on your other half. How is she? And, and quite rightly so, and uh, I'd be very happy for her to be sitting here, not me, quite frankly, but uh, she's, she's otherwise delegated engaged. delegated you, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, no doubt we'll speak to her in due course, yes. but uh, she, she's confident, is she? Yes. The uh, noises that you're getting within the party are positive? We're, we're, we uh, have been uh, following the, uh, the count as it has gone on, like everybody else, and I think that the, uh, the, the, the predictions look to be good for us. I think that we have certainly uh, increased from last time. I think that seems to be the case, and... Uh, it's been a very positive campaign in the European front because uh, Diane has done an enormous amount of work uh, throughout Northern Ireland over the last five years, in both in the Parliament and on the ground. And I think that's beginning to show where even people who haven't been DUP have been voting for or across compared to the council uh, uh, election. So, yeah, we're, we're very confident. Um, because, you know, last time round, the figures weren't great. Obviously, Jim Allister took a bit of a chunk out of the DUP vote. Uh, we'll have to see if that happens again. But there were 88,000 votes, 18.2% last time round. Are you confident that that will be significantly up? I, 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 it remains to be seen, Mark, and it's very difficult. I don't want to get into figures because it's very hard to predict. But I think that we are certainly well out comfortably in front of the unionist field. Uh, I think that just as in the council elections, the DUP will be confirmed as the leading party in unionism uh, very much so that is undoubtedly going to be the case i've been saying for some time that council elections are not our strongest elections the ulster unions always tend to do a bit better in local elections historically uh, similarly the european elections right back to 1979 have never followed and that's at a time when the dup used to do very well in them at a time when ulster unionists dominated every other election so we're very confident we're doing well. But look, when it comes to the elections for Westminster, for the Assembly, where we're electing a national government or electing our local government, I think people will rally around the strongest unionist party. Right, Martin McGuinness, um, how important is it for the three MEPs from Northern Ireland to work together, to get on together? Because um, when I was interviewing uh, Martina Anderson, your candidate, and Diane Dodds, it, it, there was a frostiness about it, let's just say. It was pretty obvious in a question I asked that they don't often go off together and, and uh, have a cappuccino and, uh, and shoot the breeze. Is that, is that unfortunate? Well, I think it is important that we always strive to ensure that there are good relationships between elected representatives and there's a particular responsibility on the three MPs to work together in the interests of all of us. Do they do that though? Well, I, th I think they do. Whether or not there's good personal relationships, I think it's down to themselves. But I, I think in the sense of there being a, a good working relationship, that's something that we always have to strive towards. I mean, remember also in... Uh, the aftermath of this election, you're also going to have three other uh, Sinn Féin MEPs, uh, Leah Narita in the south, uh, Lynn Boylan in, D in Dublin, and Matt Carthy in Midlands uh, Northwest. And I, I would hope that they will uh, assist along with all our Irish uh, MEPs, our cause here in the north. And I think this could be a very formidable team uh, advocating for all of us uh, if, they, if they have the ability to work together in, Europe, in Brussels. Uh, Nigel, can Diane and Martina do politics without being best friends forever? Yeah, I don't think you have to drink cappuccino together to put bread on the table. I mean, I think you can actually deliver as colleagues. I mean, I, I am not Martin McGuinness's uh, best friend and he's not my best friend. There wouldn't be many times I would have ever have had a cup of coffee with him. But there are things uh, that we can work together on in the best interests of everybody. Uh, I mean, that's the reality of it. We will not be uh, uh, going out uh, to share a meal together or anything like that, but we can work on the issues of common concern. And that's the difference from where we were 30 years ago. We will, I will remain a staunch uh, unionist and someone who's out to preserve the union. He will remain a Republican. But we can work together on issues of common interest, re retaining our political differences and retaining our political objectives. But I think the MEPs, I mean, uh, have worked quite effectively on common issues affecting Northern Ireland. There will be differences of emphasis between them, but that's what you get in politics. Yeah, but I suppose that the, the public perception or the public view might be that actually you could improve the relationships that you're talking about a lot, very easily, if you did go out and have a bite to eat together or sit down and share a cup of coffee. Then but actually, if you get the personal right, then the political can sometimes follow on. Yeah. I, I'm, 
I'm tempted to say, of course, that could go for a whole lot of relationships, including the media, Mark, and uh, I look forward to you inviting me out for a cup of coffee I, someday I, I, and having a chat. I'm but perfectly anyway. happy, Nigel. Anyway, uh, absolutely. Well, there you go. I, might, I, I might take you up on that. No but problem. Look, I'm buying. The, that's the, fine. The reality, the reality is in the in the world of politics, there's there are differences uh, between political parties. And look, yeah. we've got no, to be realistic. You take my point, though. Yeah, you take we've my got point. to be. Yeah, well, yes, I do. But we've got to be realistic here. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of issues uh, which fundamentally divide us, and there's a lot of history in terms of what people were engaged in in the past and what they did to people, and for which there hasn't as yet been, in my view, a full and frank apology. And that goes for personal uh, relationships as well as for the general community issues. And until we work our way through all of that, but the difference between now and 20 years ago, Mark, is okay. that people are working their way through some of these things. All right. Uh, uh, Martin, I know, you, I know you've got to so, leave us, but do you want to just pick up on that? Well, I do want to pick up on it because I think that uh, during the course of the year that uh, Ian Paisley and myself were in the office of First and Deputy First Minister together, I think the community were amazed that we actually didn't just have a good working relationship, but we actually had a good personal relationship as well. So I think personal relationships are very, very important. But the difficulty is that even during the course of that journey, uh, I have no doubt there were people within the DUP who didn't like that. And I have no doubt that there were Republicans out there who, you know, just wondered about this. Was this the right thing to do? I absolutely believe it was the right thing to do because in showing that we have not just a good working relationship, but a positive personal relationship, we send very powerful, positive messages to people at grassroots level that we really need to be getting on together. And is that what motivated you ultimately to shake hands with the Queen and to attend? Uh, events whenever the president was there in London recently? Well, I, I made it absolutely clear the first time I met Queen Elizabeth in uh, Belfast that this was uh, an attempt by me to stretch out the hand of friendship to the Union's community. And yes, that, that was what the visit to Windsor uh, was about. Uh, and I think these big acts of reconciliation are very, very important. And, and I know that they present difficulties uh, for people. I know that there were Republicans in you know, different parts of Ireland who didn't agree. Well, maybe that's going to be a bit too far saying they didn't agree. But some of them actually said they wouldn't have done it themselves. But that's what leadership is about. You, you can't lead from behind. If you're going to lead, you have to do it from the front. OK. Nigel, you just wanted to come back. Yeah, well, you don't I, have to I, give I Martin McGuinness you know, credit I mean, for that. The, the, sometimes very fine words in the abstract and all the rest of it. But you know, when you're talking about building personal relationships, it doesn't help to go around calling your partner in government a man who has stood against violence for all of his political lifetime has been consistent all of his political lifetime calling him a coward. You know, that doesn't sit well within the narrative that, well, we all need to develop personal relationships and all the rest of it. The actions and the words in the day-to-day -day political sphere need to match up to some of the sort of more gentler talk that we hear sometimes. Yes, but the encounter and, and with the Queen that wasn't very just words, that was an action. That. That, Sorry? That, the, the, the encounter with the Queen between Martin McGuinness and the Queen, that, that, those weren't just fine words, those were actions. No, no, but I'm saying that in terms of the relationships, uh, Martin McGuinness was talking there about the relationship with Ian Paisley, but, you know, they, to, to then sort of go from that then and say your, your current uh, First Minister is, is, in his words, a coward okay. when he has clearly stood against violence all his political right. life final has been very strong. And I think that sort of jars a little bit with what Martin well, McGuinness well, is well, now Final saying. word, and Martin McGuinness, on that. I think, I think Ian himself said an awful lot more than I said in relation to that. The, the, point, I was going to make, the point I was going to make was that it's a pity Mike has left, but because... Whenever I went to Windsor to meet with the Queen, it was actually Mike who was reported in the papers as saying that I had attempted to hijack history. I guess the backdrop of being invited by both the Queen Elizabeth and by the President of Ireland. You know, this was me involved in what I thought was a very, and also the Queen Elizabeth involved in a very important act of reconciliation. And she has many reasons for not meeting with me, and I had many reasons for not meeting with her, but both of us rules above all of that in the interest of trying to further the peace process. That's what we all have to do. OK, we leave it there. Um, I think you're going to go and uh, circulate and uh, maybe, if you're lucky, get yourself a cup of coffee. Uh, the rest of us can only dream of that uh, pleasure. Thank you very much Thank indeed. Mark. We'll come back, Nigel Dodds uh, and Mark Devonport, to hear your thoughts in a moment or two. But let's uh, go downstairs and hear more from Tara. Well, Mark, we've actually crossed to the other side. Not the dark side, just the other side. And Nicholas is with me. Um, they've allowed us into this end of the count just to see what's going on. So what stage are we at now? 
Well, we're at the very last stages before we'll be at the declaration of a first count of results. As you can see, where we were before, the pigeonholes are now empty. What we have here is people still sorting the last few votes into stacks of 100 in these trays here, one for each candidate. And then they're moved over to the, the, the white racks at the end there, where you'll see that some candidates are getting more votes than others. I think we probably can't say more than that at this stage. Yes, <laughs> very wise, very wise. But, I mean, most of the tallies coming through aren't giving us any major surprises, just a couple of little bits and pieces at the, at the bottom end in terms of the UKIP uh, candidate. Yes, he seems to be picking up a fair bit, and that suggests to me we know that one of the last council boxes that were opened was near in Morden, which is, of course, where he is based, so you wouldn't be surprised by that. Do so you think that's a personal vote rather than a Eurosceptic vote, considering we already have unionist Eurosceptic parties there? Oh, I, I think... One would, one would have to ask the voters themselves. I'm sure that the, I'm sure that Mr. Riley gets votes for all kinds of reasons, being Eurosceptics or being people who like him. But there's, uh, there's obviously a big choice there for people. And in terms of time then, are you thinking maybe in, in about half an hour? I know we keep saying this, but it's, it's, now that we've moved down to this side, it's looking a bit more likely. It is always going to be in half an hour's time. It's worth saying, I think we're actually the last part of the European Union to declare a first count result. I was checking with friends in Brussels earlier. They thought they hadn't yet heard from Estonia as well as us. So I checked with friends in Estonia who told me that their results had in fact been declared but in Estonian so nobody could actually understand them. And uh, I mean Tom Elliott raised some concerns earlier on about the fact that we still do the manual vote that we don't have uh, the or the manual count that we don't have the electronic count. Do you think that's something what, what's the picture like in the rest of Europe? In Belgium we do have an electronic voting system but it's it's basically your vote is encoded onto a computer card rather than being done by pushing a button or anything. I must say for myself aesthetically and uh, operationally I think you can't really beat a piece of paper which somebody physically makes a mark on. I think that's a very satisfactory way to conduct an election it's possible it could be done a bit quicker but potential for mistakes whereas in theory you wouldn't have that with the computer system yes but the point is that with a piece of paper you always have an independent thing that verifies whether the choice has actually been made according to the way the voter likes with computers there's always problems about hacking okay. and in terms of the overall picture then the parties some happy some not quite so happy I think most people are going to come away from this with something to celebrate. I have a question in my mind about the SDLP, whether the vote is going to be up a bit or down a bit. Earlier tallies had them down a bit, later tallies were a bit more encouraging for them. Um, but I think most people are going to be able to come away from this with a bit of a smile on their face. And Diane Dodd's looking as if she has increased her share from the last time. It has to be said that the last time was a historic low for the DUP at a European election, so it would be a bit surprising if she wasn't able to improve on that back to the Ulster Unionists and the low base over the council elections. Well, indeed. And, uh, you know, what we're seeing possibly is a bigger unionist vote overall than has happened in previous elections. Uh, I'm going to be watching very carefully when the results finally do come through to see exactly what the numbers are there. And talking to Mark Durkin earlier on as well about this... Uh, Perhaps a disappearance, if you like, of some of the middle-class Catholic vote. Uh, they just don't seem to be coming out for um, the SDLP and perhaps don't feel the, the desire to vote for Sinn Féin at this stage. Yeah, I mean, the cliché always was that there is a lot of middle-class Protestants who are not voting either. And I think what we're seeing is a desectarianisation, perhaps, of, of the non-voting uh, tendency among the public. But of course, the NI21, the panacea they were offering for all those lost voters, it, it didn't come to fruition. I do wonder whether the, the very public troubles that NI21 had on the eve of polling, whether that to an extent put off voters who might otherwise have been tempted to vote for them or for one of the other centre ground parties. The answer, of course, we will never know, Nicholas. No, we won't. No. <laughs> Thanks very much for Thank now. You. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, Tara. Now let's take a look at some people getting sustenance. David Simpson, William McRae and Lord Morrow are tucking into uh, some King's Hall fare. I'm not quite sure what that is, but it looks very appetising, I have to say. Margaret Ritchie wants to know if she can have share. Where did you get that, boys? Uh, there's Carol McKillen having a chat to... Is that Jerry Kelly? Jerry Kelly, yes. Looking at a small monitor. Not eating. According to some people on Twitter, I have done nothing but mention coffee all afternoon. <laughs> so I've been hinting very the, strongly. The hint hasn't been taken, though, has no, it? it hasn't yeah. been. No, no sign of no. any coffee. And plenty of BBC people up here with their arms of one length. <laughs> Not one of them would come near you with a cup of coffee. 
Uh, Can we return to the matter of the piece of paper that I uh, had and then dispensed yes. with? We Is should just possible? say hello to Alban McGuinness first of all. Hello. He's yeah. the best Martin McGuinness. Nice to see you all. He'll, he'll want us to talk about this will, piece will of he? paper. Okay, yeah. right. He's actually got another piece of paper which brings the story along a bit further. But the reason that I was looking for that to be double checked was that it changed the order because yeah. it showed, um, hey, presto, with Alban McGuinness appearing here, the SDLP actually edging ahead of Jim Nicholson in the running order. Um, it, it had had uh, Sinn Féin very firmly out in front, the DUP uh, in second place, and then the SDLP edging ahead. Now, obviously, that's good news for the SDLP, but they were only marginally ahead, and I still feel that there's more unionist votes there in terms of transfers that will probably bring Jim Nicholson home. And I'm also told that some of these tallies were um, based on votes counted prior to North Down, which is obviously a predominantly unionist area with fairly strong Ulster unionist support being counted. So it could well be that geographically the UUP will, will mount a comeback, but at least it's better news for the SDLP if they are in contention for at least a bit of the race. Yes, yeah, so that's, I, I presume, in the first instance, instance, Alba McGuinness, you would welcome that? Oh, well, naturally, but uh, doing a percentage of the poll there, we were on 14.3%, uh, which is higher than the uh, local government percentage, which is very, very encouraging. It's, well, down, it's down significantly on 2009, 16.2. Uh, well, I, I, uh, l let me say, in the context of this poll and in the context of the local government election, yes. uh, we are actually uh, marginally ahead. And being marginally ahead of Jim Nicholson at this point is a very good omen. Yes, except that we need to be very clear to help people understand at home that that doesn't necessarily mean that if um, your candidate nudges ahead of Jim Nicholson that he will win the seat because it could very well, it will come down to transfers. It will, and when yes. we saw what happened last time round, uh, and there were only 4,000 votes between you and Jim Nicholson the last time round. Yes, he was slightly right. ahead. That's the right. transfers that came in from Jim Allister carried him home way ahead of, of where you were. But, but if the situation is reversed where Jim Nicholson is actually 4,000 votes behind Alex Atwood, it certainly gives the SDLP uh, an advantage. And if you consider that... But uh, you won't pick up any transfers. That's the problem. Well, we will problem. pick up transfers. We'll not pick from, up so many. Well, well there's 40,000 between the Greens and the Alliance Party. Now, uh, I think that they, we are transfer friendly uh, to uh, a, a substantial part of that vote right. and that will give us a lift. The, the problem though is of course you've got the TUV votes there and the UKIP votes and they're of much course. more likely to go to Jim Nichols than yourself. Of course, but, but I'd also state that according to our analysis at this moment in time, the DUP are around about 20%, so they need another 5% to get to the quota. Um, and so the pool of uh, unionist votes becomes smaller uh, from which uh, uh, Jim Nicholson could draw. And, uh, sorry, Mark, I was you just going to say, what, do you buy into this theory that the nationalist vote as a whole is down and that, you know, there are more garden centre Catholics now around who aren't bothering to come out to vote because they find neither Sinn Féin nor the SDLP appealing to them? Well, whether they're garden centre Catholics or not, uh, according to Nicholas White, uh, the vote has reduced slightly, uh, and I think that that uh, is, is uh, uh, a difficulty, obviously, for ourselves and to what, try and... What, what, what about the fact that, and we touched on this, and I think it was Saturday's programme, where yes. you engaged in a, uh, in a bit of um, verbal fisticuffs, let's just say, with Gerry Adams, who said that um, he, he was perfectly happy to stand over his um, dislike publicly of um, Sinn Féin voters transferring to the SDLP because he had no confidence in the SDLP. You yes. took great umbrage at that. and You said yes. it was an outrageous yes. thing for him to say. If Sinn Féin voters transferred in bigger numbers to the SDLP, you'd have a much better chance of Alex Atwood winning the seat. Yes. Isn't, uh, that, isn't that the well, fact? Well, well uh, to this extent, if, if Sinn Féin are just getting the quota, then there's nothing for them to transfer. Uh, but if Sinn Féin exceed the quota, and I'm not certain they will, but uh, say they exceed the quota by one or two percent, uh, and those votes do not go to the SDLP, it puts us at a, a greater disadvantage. 
Nigel Dodds, what, what um, do you make of those figures? I mean, I think, Mark, I'm right in saying that that piece of paper that you were given had the DUP on about 90, isn't that right? 90,000? Um, yeah, and 95,000, I think. Although, actually, Auburn has got a slightly later tally that um, puts Ni Diane Dodds on about 96,000. On, 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 on what, sorry, 96? 96,000 in comparison to Martina Anderson on 137,000. So. OK, so that would be up, up a bit. Up a bit on 88 from five years ago. Is that enough to uh, bring a smile to your face? Or yeah, really well, I mean, of course, this is this is still with I don't well, know. I mean, I think there's still a fair number of votes to work yes, its way through the yes, system. Yes, so yes. our our figure will go up higher than. In fact, everybody's will go up. Yeah. up if a North bit. Down is yet to be counted, yeah, you've North got Down quite a few and, and all the rest of it. So yes, yeah, so we we expect our our numbers to be uh, up. Uh, considerably. I think this is a much uh, more comfortable European election for us than the previous one, obviously. But of course, remember, Diane was a new candidate at that stage, up against an incumbent MEP in Jim Allister, so it was a tougher fight. But I think that this election uh, will show that, look, for all of the difficulties and challenges that are out there, the DUP is comfortably the lead unionist party. And uh, the final outcome in terms of the figures will bear a bit of, a bit of analysis once we have all of this. But one of the issues that has come through is two things that have struck me about the elections overall is much, much higher turnout in Northern Ireland for elections than the uh, situation across the water where Scotland and Wales are sitting in below 35% turnout, where the average for the UK is 43%, the average for the EU is 43%, Northern Ireland sitting at almost 52%. Yeah, so I think it was the Czech rate. Republic was about 20%. Wasn't yeah, it? I mean, so I mean, in terms of all of this narrative that goes on about this, uh, you know, terrible turnout, I would love to see it much higher than 52%. But we are actually one of the best areas, one of the best regions in the entire EU. Yeah, and the that second doesn't say much for politics, though, Nigel, does it? No. Really, you know, I and mean, com if yeah. people really cared about politics, they would want to vote. And by the way, that's that's only 52% of the people who are registered yes, to vote. That's right. And, and I mean, I, I I am sometimes struck by the fact that even in the elections to the U.S. presidency, and what could be more important than who is the president of the United States? You know, over 40% of the people in America don't actually vote. And so, you know, there is, there, is, there is an issue here about a lot of people do not engage in politics and all the rest of it. The only point I'm making here is that when it comes to Northern Ireland, we are a lot better, a lot better in terms of turnout than other regions of the UK, indeed most of Europe, and the Irish Republic. Yes, although we shouldn't get carried away because last time around it was 43%. Yeah. And of course, the periods of our highest ever turnout, if one takes, you know, the Fermanagh South Tyrone elections of old, were, were coincidental with some of the worst periods of the Troubles. Yes, that's so, right. Would you like an apathetic peace or would you like yeah. an active There, there is a sense in which some people don't feel as motivated if it's not as intensely passionate in terms of the politics and the whole context that's going on. And quite often they were turning out to vote against yes, the against other side rather than for the other, the other point I was going to make more generally about the political... Uh, turnout this time is that undoubtedly, and this again we'll have to wait till we get the, all the results and do the analysis, but it does seem to me clear that the gap between the unionist turnout and the nationalist turnout has increased. There is a greater differential now between unionist overall and nationalist overall. Would, would and that, ha that is bucking a trend that has been evident you know, in, in recent times. And what you're seeing now is more unionists turning out uh, compared to uh, what we had previously. And, I mean, I think somebody said the gap in terms of local government had increased, had almost doubled in terms of yeah. unionist and nationalist. So I think that there is something going on here which is quite positive in terms of unionism. Uh, and I think it's something that we'll certainly be looking at. More people engaging on the unionist side, and that's a positive thing from our perspective. And obviously the challenge for everybody, but on the national side for the SDLP, is obviously how to engage more people to vote in terms of future elections. Yeah, Al Alban, how do you feel about the whole turnout issue? Because there are those, of course, who would say to you that the the, uh, the established parties have a vested interest in, in people not turning out in huge numbers. Because if we had a 100% turnout, the picture could look very, very different. You know, uh, uh, people who are passionate about the DUP yeah. and passionate about your brand of politics mm -hmm. are likely to already come out to vote. It's, it's the people who say a plague on all your houses who might be somewhere in and around the middle. But They're the ones who are not turning out to vote. But, but, but it, yes, and I think you're right to think that people in the middle, as it were, are saying, look, uh, we're fed up with politics, we're fed up with the indecision. And How do you engage them? Well, uh, you've got to say, well, if, if you don't vote, uh, you're actually, uh, this is actually a self-fulfilling prophecy because you end up with the same people uh, who are causing the, the paralysis in government. 
Uh, so we have to persuade people that it is a positive thing to come out and vote in order to change politics. Do you, do you subscribe to the view that if you don't vote, you don't have the right to an opinion? Oh, no, I, I don't subscribe to that, but I, I, I think that it's very important to encourage... Some people do. Well, I, th I think that it, that it would be fatal for a politician to, be, to, to, to adopt that particular point of view. I think people are entitled to an opinion, and I think people are entitled not to vote if they don't want to vote. Because some countries, of course, do have compulsory voting. They do, they do, and uh, it, it is fairly well complied with as well. Mm -hmm. and uh, so why and should we? Would, 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 would you think that would be a good idea? Uh, well, I, I would think an increase in turnout would be a good idea. Whether you should compel people to vote or not, that, that would deserve a, a, a very lengthy debate, right. I think. Nice, nice. The, other, the other alternative, Nigel Dodds, is to give everyone a free lottery ticket on their way out of the polling yeah. stations, of course. That's right. Well, As opposed to the threat of a fine, if yes. they don't yeah. vote, yeah. Sticks or carrots? Yeah, I mean, having said that, I have noted that uh, there was one noted political commentator in this election who said that he was quite deliberately making the decision not to vote. And he took that as a as a choice, and you know you've got to respect. Well, that's the Alex fact. Kane, isn't yes, it? Yes, Alex yeah. Kane. So, uh, you know, m some people might say to him now, well, any future articles you write about the political process, I've said you know, it will be taken. I've said he's not entitled to an opinion slightly, anymore. Slightly different. <laughs> no, I take the view that people are entitled to opinion, no matter if they vote or not. Just in the same way, if you've never been in hospital, you're still entitled to a view in the National Health Service because okay. it might affect you someday. But the point about it is that uh, I don't believe in compulsory voting for the simple reason that in a free democracy uh, where everybody's an equal citizen, people should be free to vote or not vote. They shouldn't be compelled in terms of voting if they don't wish to vote. OK, all right. Thank you very much. Interesting uh, discussion. And by the way, if you want to uh, contribute to the debate on Twitter, uh, Mark and I are checking our uh, Twitter feeds as we go. He's at Mark Devonport. I'm at Mark Carruthers 7. Some of you are tweeting... Uh, Interesting little messages still, by the way, in case you're following that discussion. No sign of the coffee, but we live in hope. I, I think they prefer oh, the coffee. Look, coffees are floor manager yeah. has the coffee. And uh, Peter will bring the coffee on as I hand over to Tara on the count floor. Yes, you enjoy that coffee. Well deserved. Uh, and with me is another one of the candidates, Anna Lowe. Anna, what sort of vote are you looking at? What are you hearing? What are your tallies telling you? Well, we're quite hopeful that we will get the best results for European elections in recent times for the party. So we're quite pleased about the results. What sort of estimate are you putting on at the minute? What sort of percentage? So far, we are between seven and eight. So it fluctuates, as you know, as the badge you know, comes on, 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 onto the table. Um, so, yeah, we're looking good. We're very pleased about the results so far. Uh, on, on the back of, of election, uh, local election uh, results recently. So, I mean, we now have representatives on seven of the 11 super councils. So, certainly, uh, we will build on that and we want to build a shared future for everyone here in Northern Ireland. How do you think the campaign went for you? It's very, very tiring, and to be honest, you do a few days job in Stormont with, with legislation, with committee work, and then out knocking on doors. And I am just getting ready for lying in bed for a little bit uh, next morning. Well, probably not, because tomorrow we're back to Stormont shop. Uh, you know, from from well, actually, I have an early morning meeting, a breakfast meeting at half past eight. As far as I remember, so there will not be a line for me. Lots of, lots of work still to be done. But in terms of the campaign and the constitutional issues that came up for you right at the beginning, do you feel that uh, that, that hasn't done your vote any harm? Well, uh, I don't think so. To be honest, really, it was more the hype of, from the media about the constitutional issue. Um, people feel secure that you know the status of Northern Ireland really has been decided by the Good Friday Agreement and what I said was very much one politician's long-term view and when you knock on the doors people don't ask you about the border issue people ask you about jobs the children you know leaving university are still sitting at home with no jobs to go to about nursery places not enough nursery places in South Belfast about hospital appointments, long hospital appointments, waiting lists, A&E problems. People really do care about 
bread and butter issues and quite rightly because those are the issues of relevance to them. But those are the issues that a lot of people, you hear this time and time again, feel that the Assembly is not delivering. No, no, unfortunately the two majors party have not been delivering and people are very annoyed, very frustrated about the waste of money on a number of issues like the maze, like the education and skills authorities and, 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 and welfare reform. So people are really concerned and, and mostly frustrated and saying, well, you know, the major parties and, and just bickering the us and them politics are not helping us to move forward. Are you frustrated by the people who stay at home? Because really, um, whatever percentage each of the parties comes out with, it's really only half of that whenever you think that half of people didn't vote. That's true. I mean, that, in fact, when you look at it, you, you could ask yourself, is this a democratic process? Because half of the population have not bothered to come out, or half of those who are eligible to vote have not come out. So, and, and I think too, I mean, we are frustrated too, watching all the spoiled votes. I think maybe the elector, uh, election, uh, electoral um, office should next time round educate people more. We are seeing thousands of vo uh, uh, spoiled votes people putting ticks and X's instead of numbering them. So you think people were confused rather than a situation where perhaps they were spoiling their vote? I, I, I think so. I think people genuinely just, just uh, uh, are not maybe au fait of putting the numbers. And we've seen so many of people just, uh, yes, ticking them or, or marking X, X, X and yeah, or one, one, one. So, I mean, those people, their, their voice then, the voices have not been counted and I think maybe there needs to be more publicity, better communication to let people know how to write on the ballot papers which, which are so important and, and you know people take the border to come out to polling station to vote and you want their vote to count. So is that part of the reason why this is all taking so long and are you frustrated by the length of time the vote is taking? I think it's a manual process that's taking time. I mean, I have long been saying this is so okay. If we're not having electronic voting, at least I think we need to have electronic counting. It's so easy for people to mark the paper and then, you know, to be read by a computer rather than to be read manually and counted again and again. But at least it, uh, it should be right. It should be right, it should be right, but computers should be more accurate than human eye. When it comes to the overall picture then, is there a sense of relief within the Alliance Party that NI21 have not done as well? Because some people would have said that they were trying to go into an area that could have been uh, traditionally your sort of support. Yes, I mean, they, they could be, you know, competing against ourselves. But I have to say, I know what it's like for week after week to be knocking on doors, uh, you know, at all weathers. I do feel very sorry for the candidates who have put their faith in a new party, you know, um, claiming to have fresh politics and they have attracted, I think, a lot of young people. And I do feel sorry for them that they've put the trust in the party that's now falling apart. And, and I hope they will not you know, give up hope on politics and uh, they will continue to be active in politics. Or is that some sort of ground then that you could be moving into? Does the Alliance need to appeal to the younger voter more? Yes, we, we will want to, to see, you know, how, how we can maybe help people, uh, encourage them to, to come and join the party if they want. And certainly, uh, you know, I just hate to see people so enthusiastic in politics, particularly young people, um, for them to give up hope. What about the electoral pacts then and this discussion over the weekend about Naomi Longseed, about you know, South Belfast? How would you like to see that play out? We absolutely don't want to see it. We want to see fair play. And I think as Naomi said on Sunday Politics, if they make into a pack of you know, East Belfast, South Belfast, that is doing away the democratic process. That is not giving voters the choice. I think people need to be very clear about this and fair play that's what we ask for. So what now for the Alliance Party? Obviously the leaders talks aren't going to happen tomorrow as we had uh, been promised. What happens next in your view? 
uh, in terms of the... Just in terms of political progress between yeah. the five main parties. Well, we certainly need to sort out the past. We need to sort out the parades with the you know, parading season coming back so soon. We don't want another summer of, of you know, of rioting and, and discontent. And I think, you know, all those issues need to be resolved and need to be resolved very quickly. But is there any likelihood of that, given the massive impetus that went into the Haas talks before Christmas? I think people need to put their hearts and minds into, into it. I think, you know, what stopped it, the progress in the last few weeks certainly must have been the election. So, you know, between now and the next election, you know, hopefully the politicians will redouble their effort and try to sort this out within the next, you know, few months and, and, and get it over the line that, you know, with the elections coming back again next early next or early next next spring, summer, then you know we, we can put all that away. Anna Lowe, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Back to you, Mark. Okay, Tara, thanks very much indeed. We've had a bit of a personnel change on our uh, special election set. Edwin Putz uh, from the DUP has joined us. Uh, Health Minister, of course, nice to see you. Thank you very much indeed. But Gareth Gordon, our political correspondent, is here. And um, with a health warning, some interesting news you're picking up. Yes, well, I mean, obviously, as you know, anyway, Martin Anderson of Sinn Féin is going to top the poll. Um, everybody feels that then Diane Dodds comes in, comes in second. She's she's safe as well. Both both of those women safe. Then it gets really really interesting. I've been told by multiple sources, including the uh, Alliance leader David Ford, that it's a pretty tight squeeze then for the third seat, and that's between Jim Nicholson and Jim Allister, the former DUP MEP, leader of the TUV, who's done extremely well. Uh, Jim Nicholson's uh, result, I'm told, has not replicated the, the, the decent result that the Ulster Unionist Party had in the council elections. And certainly there are quite a number of worried UUP people in the body of the hall. And I'm also told that uh, when we get the uh, uh, redistribution of Martina Anderson's surplus, um, then we may be eliminating the, the bottom four candidates. This count, I'm told, could go on even until tomorrow. But certainly, while Jim Nicholson will probably win, it's far from certain. OK. Um, we're hearing that Jim Allister could be 2,000 ahead at this stage of Jim Nicholson. Is that what you hear? Um, I'm hearing a number of different things, but everything is pointing in the same direction, that he's either very close to Jim Nicholson or just ahead of Jim Nicholson. And a lot could come down to where Henry Riley's UKIP transfers go. And Henry Riley tells me he's polled more than 20,000 votes, votes still being counted. And they would be likely to go to Jim Allister, well, first and would, foremost, you would imagine. You, you could never say, but you would certainly not be surprised if that was the case. Um, but of course, some of the other candidates who may be eliminated will have small numbers and probably they would not go to Jim Allister. The, you would imagine it would be Henry Riley's transfers the bulk of which would go to Jim Allister. You know, he's hardly going to get lots of transfers from people like the Green and maybe even NI21, you're right. And would you, would you imagine that Jim, yeah, Jim Nicholson is going to pick up, he's going to pick up some transfers? I mean, just, just to be clear for people, in 2009, um, Jim Nicholson depended on Jim Allister's transfers, actually, well, to get got, home. That was the difficulty for Alex Atwood, was that he didn't have the transfers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and certainly Jim Nicholson picked up a lot more transfers from, because Jim Nicholson, was behind Diane Dawes in first preference, but was actually elected ahead of her. She didn't reach the quota. Uh, I, I don't know that that's going to happen. Well, I don't think Diane Dawes will need that sort of help this time. But then the question is, we've got 10 candidates this time. We only had six candidates the last time, so it's a much more muddy picture. But certainly, uh, Jim Nicholson, I'm told, that will, if he gets in, and he, he would still be the slight favourite, it'll be the, his worst ever European performance. OK. Edwin, you're thoughts on what Gareth has just told us and just to reiterate it comes with a very large health warning it is speculation we don't have any confirmed figures but as Gareth says he's hearing that from multiple sources this afternoon yeah well I've been down at the cool face and and have looked at the boxes and our, our tallies would indicate that there's a very marginal difference now between Jim Allister and Jim Nicholson do you think Jim Allister's slightly ahead it's uh, pretty marginal at this point in time uh, and there's still a lot of votes on the table to be counted, so that can that can change at any point, depending on whether it's uh, it's being counted at, at any particular time. Uh, I suppose the issue is that the Ulster Unionists were um, cock a hoop about having a 0.9% rise in the council elections, 
Um, I think this, uh, this uh, result here is going to be a devastating blow to Mike Nesbitt and the Ulster Unionist Party. This is uh, a very, very poor result on, on their part. As Garth indicated, it's their worst ever European election result. My hunch is that Jim Nicholson will, will limp across the line uh, very late in, in the actual count. Uh, but it's a very, very poor uh, turnout for them. But that would be good news for you because the last thing you want, surely, is Jim Allister to take the seat. Your arch critic, the DUP's nemesis. Well, and he's going to claim this is a tr whether he wins the seat or doesn't win the seat. If he comes close, if he runs Jim Allister as close, Jim Nicholson as close as we think he might have done, he's going to be crowing about that with justification. Well, it's interesting that he's taken the votes from the Ulster Unionist Party as opposed to the DUP. And uh, I think that's something that Mike Nesbitt's going to have to look at. Because but he took 87,000 votes from you last time.